This is a Reader's Digest version containing many of the interesting parts of the Flat Earth Theory. For those who have already started seeing things with new eyes, it will be mostly a recap, but there could be a few new angles you haven't looked at. For the rest of you who are new to this, the first question is invariably, is this a joke? Because it's a joke, right? And that's where we start, because it's one of our two basic childhood facts. One plus one equals two, and the Earth is a globe. We're taught this before almost everything else, and that right there should give you a clue on how serious this secret is. But for those who have forgotten their history, here's the modified Men in Black version. For the first 4,000 years of our civilization, we believed that the Earth was a flattish disk surrounded by a solid dome barrier called the firmament. All of the five major religions had their own version of this, and the churches enforced the belief. Then, around 1514, a man named Copernicus created a new model of the world. He stated that if the Earth was spinning around 1,100 miles an hour, and circling the sun at 60,000 miles an hour, the world was then round. And while the math more or less worked, there was a problem. It was 1500, and the technology to prove such a theory wasn't there. The first balloon to carry people wasn't invented until 1760. Sailboats were the only travel over water, and the fastest thing on land was a horse. But the new worldview was promoted and took hold. The religions adapted to handle the new reality, and life moved on. More importantly, the globe model was quickly introduced into the education systems. Over the next 500 years, the challenges to this model faded, to the point where the globe was accepted as universally as physical laws such as gravity. Read that again if you didn't absorb it. For 20 generations, people believed that the earth was round because there was a globe in every classroom they sat in. There was no proof. Hundreds of years went by, and still civilization had no way of proving the theory. Planes were invented around 1900, but until 1957 nothing could go high enough to give a true perspective of where we lived. And that's when everything got strange. The United States and Russia both sent up rockets high enough to take decent pictures, and what they saw scared them a great deal. How do we know they were extremely concerned about the sky? Because the US and Russia immediately started firing nuclear weapons straight up, and they kept firing for the next four years. A few things to keep in mind here. First, this was now 1958. Nuclear weapons were very expensive and hard to come by. These also weren't those nominal yield 20 kiloton toys we used on Hiroshima. This was high kiloton to low megaton, and we couldn't get them up fast enough. And the strangeness continued in other places. In 1959, only a year into the atmosphere bombardment, ten nations, including the United States, made Antarctica off-limits to any colonization. A treaty was put in place, and to this day remains intact. Over 50 nations now have signed off on this treaty. Do you know any treaty that has lasted that long between all industrialized nations? Moreover, do you know any piece of real estate in the world that is owned by no one? You would think at the very least one of the large oil companies would use their huge financial resources to explore this region, and yet they don't even petition the idea. The short version of the discovery is this. By 1958, the military had discovered the very solid upper and outer edges of our world and had to create a way to put up do not enter signs without looking obvious. It was tricky, but if there is one thing I have learned about the authority, it's that nothing is left to chance. Most of the work had already been done for them, so their job was primarily in the details. The sky part of the dome was much higher than commercial air traffic. So the only thing they had to worry about there was the space program, which is immediately militarized. The outer border had the natural benefit of not only an extensive ocean, but a scaling decrease in temperature and a steady increase in iceberg frequency to discourage ships, all leading to a permanently frozen landmass that could not be used for any form of agriculture. This ocean and ice layout had worked well for thousands of years because the technology of the current civilization didn't evolve quickly. 
Sailors avoided cold weather seas whenever possible, and oxygen levels get low enough to harm people, even on high mountains. The brilliance of the design comes in the simple fact that human males are corrupted by power. Corruption so total, in fact, that they would rather hide the world itself rather than risk their power on it. You could theorize that kings and popes were told of the world a long time ago. Maybe an ancient scroll or book. Perhaps an interdimensional being told the tale of what the world looked like. But this was all but dismissed, because even the most powerful leaders of the day couldn't reach the borders. And if they couldn't, what chance did the de general public have? It's one thing to be told of the giant impenetrable dome, but it's a whole different animal when you finally stand right next to it. Then the tough decisions have to be made. Do we keep the secret? And how far are we willing to go to keep the status quo? Once they decided to keep the secret, no expense was spared. The rapid progression of rocketry science had to be addressed quickly, and so the moon missions were created. Matt from the NASA channel was right in his thinking that you needed the moon mission event to stage a picture of the Earth from deep orbit, and that couldn't be more true. Establishing NASA as the front-runner of space exploration also diverted people who would have otherwise created their own space companies for profit. The best engineers, technicians, and pilots were recruited to the NASA space program. Once there, they were compartmentalized on a need-to-know basis. The astronauts know of the deception and are sworn to secrecy under the penalty of whatever motivates them. Private space programs are discouraged, sabotaged, or absorbed into the NASA fold. Private sector spacecraft are just not going to be allowed for several reasons. The most obvious is the collision with the dome itself. The telemetry data from such a mission would show an impact failure at a certain altitude, and if repeated, would raise questions NASA just isn't prepared to answer. There are three perpetual questions about our world that can't be eliminated, but avoided at all costs. These are the questions you should ask yourself and others if this protective layer is going to be lifted. I'd like to preface this with a thank you to Max Malone, a conspiracy hardcore who has a knack for boiling down debates to a single paragraph whenever possible. It was he who said, after over 50 years and thousands of hours of space travel footage, both by NASA and other countries, there is no exterior shot where the astronaut completes the simple act of panning the camera 180 degrees, let alone a full 360 degree sweep. This has never happened on any moon mission, exterior space station, nothing, ever. Statistics will tell you that this would have already happened by accident years ago, but it hasn't, and it won't. This is because of the rule they cannot break, the same rule that applies to television set shows that never show the fourth wall. Why? Because there is no fourth wall. Number two. When you search online for pictures of the Earth from space, 95% of what you will see is a collection of artificial composite shots. In 2000, when I did this search, there was exactly one picture by NASA showing the bottom part of Africa and Antarctica. Now that picture is hidden within hundreds of simulated images. There are HD cameras everywhere and no one is taking a shot of the Earth because you can't get enough altitude to do it. Number three, the commercial air travel routes for the southern hemisphere are wrong. This is an easy thing you can check out in 60 seconds. Take a map reading of the distance between anywhere near Australia and anywhere in South America. It's a straight shot across the South Pacific. Now find your favorite travel site and try to get there nonstop. See what happens. The routes start turning ridiculous. I used to business travel for years and I've never seen anything like it. It's the one thing in the general public world they can't hide, the actual distance between these two places. On a round world, the flight is easy, just a straight shot across an ocean. But on a flat world, it becomes the greatest distance between two points. There are no shortcuts, so they distract you with multiple connections and layovers. 
It's only blind luck that the United States was in the Northern Hemisphere. Otherwise, the increased traffic would have raised eyebrows by now. I know. I know. It's madness. It's lunacy. There are people who will tell you straight to your face that all the leaders of the world are lizards, and yet these people laugh out loud when you say the words flat earth. I was, and still am, a huge conspiracy guy. I literally ran out of new tin hat topics to research, and I still wouldn't look at this one without embarrassment. But every time I glanced at it, there was something unresolved, and once I saw the near perfection of the whole plan, I was hooked. Do your own homework. Ask the questions. Get past the possibility and see if you can move into an even bigger picture, like who built the dome and why. That's where it starts to get really interesting and things start opening up. I know I said years ago that the greater good was something that should be preserved, that JFK, Pearl Harbor, and 9-11 were inevitable. I still believe it. And I understand the decisions. The globe illusion, however, has run its course over the last 500 years. It's time to start again. If that means we end up getting the attention of who or what created this place and force the reset of the world, is that such a bad thing? I've put some links in the description that you might want to check out, like the current map projections used by the USGS, the United Nations logo, the Flat Earth Society, high-altitude nuclear tests, the Antarctica Treaty, among others. I'm not allowing ratings or comments on this video for several reasons. One, this topic seems to bring out the worst debates because of the initial denial. That, and I've seen dedicated trolls on the Flat Earth Society website who show up every day and say the same thing to new forum members. It's a joke. It's not serious. Nothing to see here. Kind of strange that there are full-time trolls on a site that has less than 500 members worldwide. That being said, please feel free to contact me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or heck, just call 303-494-6631. I know no one uses the actual phone anymore, but I'll answer what I can. Flat Earth Clues Part 1 The Empty Theater this is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. The clue you have to look at is built upon another conspiracy that has been around for decades, namely the space program. Most of those watching this are aware of the varying theories revolving around NASA, the Apollo program, the space shuttle, the International Space Station, and so on. The clue itself isn't based on one of these highly debated topics, but the lack of one. More specifically, motion pictures based on actual events. This, like others in the series, is something you can check out for yourself. Everything you need to reference this is online. To begin, think of all the movies involving space travel that you've seen in your lifetime. You'll start with the obvious. Star Wars, Star Trek, Alien, just to name a few. In fact, if you go through your own personal list, you could probably come up with over 100 different off-world movies without breaking much of a sweat. That part is easy. For the second group, try to come up with space movies that aren't fantasy-based. You'll get a list that has Red Planet, Gravity, Mission to Mars, 2001, things like that. These films will usually take on a not-so-distant future theme, and where we could be down the road. And it's still a pretty good sized list. These first two groups of films are encouraged by the authority because they reinforce the globe model through assumption. The entertainment system demands that the globe view and solar system concept is a given. Therefore, the actual world view must also be true. Or to put it another way, if you're using your suspension of disbelief as you watch a movie like, say, Gravity, then subconsciously you're reinforcing the movie right on top of the real world. The more of these movies you watch and enjoy, the more the lines blur between what you want to believe 
and what you actually know. Watch enough movies about Mars and you will be less astonished when NASA announces an actual mission to Mars. Same with the Moon, other solar systems, and so on. Releasing the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey in 1968, right before the actual Moon missions, was no accident. It took the greatest director of all time five years to make, and several people who saw the theater screenings claimed that many military groups were listed in the credits, only to be removed years later. But 2001 is just a side note of this clue. For those who really want to dig into Stanley Kubrick's hidden vision, I highly recommend the documentary Room 237. A link to it is below as well. Now you are aware of the first two groups of space films. There are those that contain generous amounts of fantasy, and those who try to paint our near future. These two groups are easy to find. The third group is a challenge. And again, that's where things get interesting. The Moon missions concluded in 1972, and even though it's still considered the greatest achievement by mankind, no fact-based movies were made regarding it until The Right Stuff was released in 1983. Now you might say that it had only been 11 years, and maybe it was tough to get the rights, and so on, but that's not what made the film interesting. The movie ran extremely long for 1983, coming in at 3 hours and 12 minutes. It was an exhaustive look at the astronaut selection process, the competition, and the training facility itself. But when the credits rolled 3 hours later, chronologically, they had only gotten to the low Earth orbit missions. Just for fun, Google the Right Stuff movie and see how many spacecraft you can find. It won four Academy Awards, and did a great job at the box office, but the Apollo missions were never touched. The only other major motion picture that involved the actual moon program was Apollo 13 in 1995, a full 12 years later. Apollo 13 only covered a single moon orbit and no landing or close-up reference to the previous missions below them. And after 1995, that was it. Nothing. Hollywood is known for leaving no stone unturned, with reboots and sequels to nearly everything. Yet in almost 60 years, there has never been a single moon mission movie based on actual events. Hundreds of science fiction films reference in it. Everything from Superman to the Transformers, but literally nothing that covers the moon's surface. Six complete moon missions involving multiple vehicles, moon buggies, playing golf, and no one wants to touch it. Now to be fair, there was a TV miniseries in 1998 covering the subject. It was produced by Tom Hanks, who got involved after starring in Apollo 13. There has been no professional production of any kind since then. Again, just for fun, Google from Earth to the Moon TV series and see what you find. The why is easy, and the clue revealed. If Hollywood makes a movie about the moon landings, and it's indistinguishable from the real thing, then how do you know which is real? It raises some subtle questions involving stage technique and how long they've been in place. If Hollywood could fake it now, then when did they first have the ability there is one other movie which stands out, and I mention it because I can't believe it ever got made, is Capricorn 1. The film's plot involved the faking of a Mars mission and how it could be accomplished. In short, it's part of the Conspiracy World Bible. I highly recommend it, and the link is below. To summarize, all space movies are encouraged by the authority, except for the ones that are based on actual accounts. Those are not allowed. The Moon program has been buried in entertainment because the Moon cannot be reached. It's either outside the barrier or just a highly rendered image, like any planet you see when entering a video game. The world is flat, and this is just one clue. So do some of your own research and ask questions. Please feel free to email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or 303-494-6631.
Flat Earth Clues, Part 2, The Bird Wall. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue revolves around one of the most remarkable men you may have never heard of, Richard E. Byrd, and his relationship with Antarctica and the secret of missions he carried out there until his dying day. Some of you have followed the legend of Richard Byrd through the hollow earth theory, we aren't going to be covering any hollow earth in this video, but instead focus on the man and his involvement with the South Pole. The Reader's Digest version of Richard Byrd is as follows. Born in 1888, he became an American naval officer who specialized in feats of exploration. He was a pioneering American aviator, Medal of Honor winner, polar explorer, aircraft navigator, expedition leader in the worst environments in the world, and the youngest admiral in the history of the Navy. In addition, his list of awards takes up several pages in Wikipedia, including three ticker tape parades in his honor. In short, he was Indiana Jones on steroids. Some people will say that Roy Chapman Andrews was the real Indiana Jones, and you might be right. But Richard Byrd beat Indy six days a week and twice on Sunday. I mention all his accolades to paint a picture of credibility and trust. The governments of the United States and the world trusted his judgment and leadership, and took advantage of every chance they had to put him in charge of special missions. The first large-scale mission was an expedition to Antarctica in 1928. This was noteworthy, because even though he had just flown over the North Pole in 1926, all expeditions from 1928 on were focused on the South. The expedition lasted two years, and during it, at the age of 41, he was promoted to admiral. His second Antarctic expedition ran from 1933 to 1935, and his third from 39 to 40. While in Antarctica, he was also an advisor for other countries who had their own expeditions, including England, France, Germany, and building off previous countries' expeditions from Belgium, Japan, and Sweden. He then helped lead U.S. Navy fleet operations in World War II, was present during the Japanese surrender in 1945, but then something strange happened. He went back to Antarctica. Now, some of you aren't surprised because he'd been there since 1928, and I agree with you. It's the how that's interesting here. His fourth trip to Antarctica wasn't an expedition. It was a military operation called Operation High Jump commanding an entire aircraft carrier group that included 13 support ships, Admiral Byrd led 4,700 men to the South Pole, for reasons that are still shrouded to this day. Some say they were chasing the remaining Nazi fleet, even though Germany had surrendered a full year earlier. Others say there was a Nazi base established in Antarctica during the war, when Admiral Byrd was absent. None of these theories are important for this video. What we do know is that the U.S. had sent an excessively large military force to the ice, all under the guise of peaceful intentions. During this operation, Admiral Byrd told a Chile newspaper this, The most important result of his observations and discoveries is the potential effect that they have in relation to the security of the United States. The fantastic speed in which the world is shrinking, recalled the Admiral, is one of the most important lessons learned during his recent Antarctic exploration. I have to warn my compatriots that the time has ended when we were able to take refuge in our own isolation and rely on the certainty that the distances, the oceans, and the poles were a guarantee of safety. After the operation, Admiral Byrd toured the States and gave interviews, the most interesting of which is a national television show in 1954 called The Long Ines Chronoscope. A horrible name, but a decent show. I've added a segment of it at the end of this video and linked it in the description. During this television interview, he first spoke of an area beyond the South Pole as large as the United States, which no one had set foot on yet. He then went on to say that there would probably be expeditions year after year because the U.S. government had really become interested. The interviewers then probed as to why the interest in the South, when any perceived military threat from Russia, keep in mind this was 1954, would be from the North. 
He went on to say that it was the most valuable and important place in the world for science. It involved the future of the nation, an untouched reservoir of untapped resources, including coal, oil, minerals, and uranium. He added that at the time of the interview, there were seven nations currently engaged in Antarctica, including Russia, Australia, Argentina, Chile, and New Zealand. During the interview, the Admiral talked about planning the next military mission to Antarctica. It was called Operation Deep Freeze and ran from 1955 to 1956. The mission was completed and he supposedly returned home. Now this is where you come in and say, so what? And normally I'd agree with you, except for what happened next. Nothing happened next. The missions just suddenly stopped and that was it. No other expeditions, military or otherwise, were conducted on the continent, ever. Then a treaty was put in place banning any country from doing basically anything. The end. And if you're wondering what you're missing, it's this. Admiral Byrd goes on television, says that this massive body of land, most of which sits on a plateau two miles high, is rich with every resource you could ever want energy rich, pristine, with no indigenous population or plant life, and every country that has sent teams is ready to carve it up like a big turkey. Not to mention there's an expanse of land larger than the United States they haven't even looked at yet. And out of the blue everyone just calls the whole thing off? There are no environmentalists in 1959. This is land of diner food and 20 cent gas. I'm calling total BS on this one. The dollar value of the initial resources find would have fueled armies of greedy companies. So what happened? They found the edge, that's what. And the last thing they were going to do was let unsupervised companies near it, regardless of the money. Even if it was hundreds of miles away, you couldn't allow resource corporations even into a safe area and then years down the road as they expanded, tell them, oh, sorry, you can't go beyond this point. When the companies would ask why, what would you tell them? And now the interior of Antarctica is off limits, with no revisions until the year 2041. You can take tours of the outer islands, but there is a hidden line, enforced by the military, that you will not be able to cross because the interior is actually the exterior edge. It's there, it's hidden, and it's protected. The earth you live on is flat. So do some of your own research and ask questions. Please feel free to email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or 303-494-6631. Our very distinguished guest for this evening is Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The North Pole used to be a no-man's land, but uh, these are the days when, by buying a ticket on a commercial airliner, you can fly across the North Pole and drink a cocktail at the same time. Yet only three score or more years ago, about 35 years ago, our guest tonight found out whether there was any land north of the North American continent. He made that first discovery flight, and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any yes. unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole because it's getting crowded up there now because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. That's a tremendous So job. there's a lot of adventure left mm -hmm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, Admiral a, an expedition to which I believe you're the advisor is now en route. Uh, what is that expedition doing? Well, that's the icebreaker, Atka. 
and it's a reconnaissance expedition, is going down to the South Pole area to make certain observations and to, to look for some bases. They will be back in April, and they will report back, and upon the information we get from that undertaking, uh, we will base the bigger expedition that's to follow. Uh, is that very definitely planned, or uh, is that... Uh, that is being planned right now. So I'm willing to say to you that uh, there will be a number of expeditions that will follow, I think, uh, year after year, at the bottom of the world, because the government has really become interested. Well, Admiral Byrd, I can understand, I think everybody can, the interest in the North Pole because it's so near our greatest challenger, Soviet Russia. But why this interest in the uh, bottom of the world? Nobody living down there, is there? No, it's, um, it's pretty cold. There's only one permanent resident, that's the Emperor Penguin. The little ones live further north. I tell you one reason they're interested. It's by far the most uh, valuable, important place left in the world for science. That's why the scientific groups all over the nation are really interested. But more important than that, it's, uh, it has to do with the future uh, of the nation, those to come after us, or even uh, during your lifetime. Because it happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. And uh, you know, as the world shrinks with an ever-increasing acceleration, far-flung places, once useless like we thought the North Pole was, and no man's land, become very useful. Uh, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. Uh, does it, I was going to ask you, does it have military importance? Uh, it has some, and uh, as the world shrinks, it will continue to shrink with an ever-increasing acceleration, thus bringing these places closer. And in the future, I can see a time when it will be very, very important strategically. Well, has the development and, and of air power increased their, the strategic importance of places like the uh, oh, very much Palmer so. Peninsula, we'll say? Uh, very much so. Even now, if uh, anything happened and we uh, lost the Panama Canal, we would have to control the islands just north of Antarctica, which are part of Antarctica. Then between it. there and Cape... Admiral, you speak of the resources of Antarctica. What are they? What, uh, what are the natural resources there? Well, uh, we've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains. It's not covered with snow. Enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. Well, uh, that's, that's the coal. Now, there's evidence of uh, other, many other minerals. Uh, we are pretty sure there's oil. Now, that coal shows the bottom of the world. Now, by far, the coldest spot in the world. Where that coal is gets 100 below zero in the winter. Well, uh, it was once tropical. So, uh, we think there's oil there, and there's evidence, probably uranium there. Is it any secret? Is there uranium there? That would be the only thing that would be practical to uh, actually go after, I suppose. Everything else would be economically uh, unfeasible, wouldn't it? Well, as we recklessly expend our resources, the time will come when we can, we'll have to go after that stuff down there. Well, you know, I, I avoided what you said about uranium. I'm not sure about that. I don't want to have the world fight over the Antarctic. And Robert, is there a competition among other nations to try to get information about uh, Antarctica and uh, possibly to secure some of these resources? Well, uh, yes. Uh, there are now seven nations very much interested. Russia is interested tremendously. That I'm sure of. Australia has an expedition down there. The Argentine, the Chile, New Zealand, Britain, and so on. Now, you can understand those people down there being uh, interested because they live down there, the New Zealanders, the Argentinians, the Chileans, and the Australians. And so uh, we, uh, we don't do much about claiming anything. Admiral, you uh, make this sound a little crowded. Uh, uh, are, are, are there that many expeditions now there or en route there? Uh, well, you know, as I said, it's the most peaceful place in the world, but I don't think it will be for long because of this intense interest on the part of, uh, of other nations and this nation. Flat Earth Clues, Part 3, The Mapmakers.
This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue looks into the USGS, otherwise known as the map makers of the world, and a few surprising things that they and others have in common with the flat earth idea. All the reference links are provided in the description below and I encourage you to check them out. For those of you outside of the United States, USGS stands for United States Geological Survey, a scientific branch of the US government. Formed in 1879 and with the help of the ever-expanding American Empire, they quickly became the pre premier map makers of the known world. Currently, they have around 9,000 employees and an annual budget of over a billion dollars a year. They also have extensive science departments covering biology, geography, geology, hydrology, and many programs tied to them. Their motto since the 1990s has been science for a changing world, and I'm going to show you how true that really is. What does this large, really boring government group have to do with the flat earth? To understand that, you have to look into their origins, which is in geography. To do this, you'll need to open another page that specializes in maps. The maps you see in this video are from Wikipedia, but there are others you can reference as well. The wiki list of map projections isn't much to look at as a whole, although there are a number of interesting takes on the world view. Not only do they have just about every perspective when it comes to the land we live on, but some detailed information on where the map originated, including name type, the origin or creator, and the year the map perspective was proposed. Now some of these will be very familiar, especially the ones that you would see on your classroom wall. There are a number of variations here, but the one that has been debated on recently would be this one, the Gauls Peters, which accurately shows the size difference between the continents, the most obvious clue being that the white continent of Greenland is actually tiny compared to Africa. But I digress. If you keep going down through all the different shapes, you'll get into circular maps, but only one of these is a top-down perspective that shows the continents in the center surrounded by an unbroken ring of ice. In wiki, it's called the azimuthal equidistant, and just to make it easier, I'm going to abbreviate and call it AE for short. Why is this map so interesting? Well, if you're looking at the wiki page, you'll spot a few reasons. The first is that in the notes section of the map, and I quote, used by the USGS in the National Atlas of the United States. It also mentions that it is used as the emblem of the United Nations. Of all the maps on this screen, it is the only one that references a group of any kind. And if you keep this page open and navigate over to the Flat Earth section of Wiki, you'll notice towards the bottom of the page a similar map. I've referenced it here and you can tell quite easily it's identical, but not referenced or linked as the AE model. To make things even more strange, we go back to the USGS model and you see that it was first proposed a thousand years ago and you may think, well, that's a bad link. So you compare it with the person who proposed it and you get this guy, Al Biruni. Who was Al Biruni? Well, he lived around a thousand years ago and was considered one of the greatest scholars of his era, schooled in multiple sciences. Have you ever heard of him? I hadn't. Maybe it's multiple bad references in Wiki. Well, no, because NASA knows who he is and named this moon crater after him. So why is the USGS using a version of the world map designed by a thousand-year-old Persian scientist? Because it's correct. That's why. So to be clear, let's compare them again. The United Nations flag, the USGS official map of the Earth, and the Flat Earth model. All identical, but one isn't recognized and instead ridiculed as an outdated look at the world. And this is one of those political quandaries that the authority gets stuck in. The short version is this. The government is on the same page as the Flat Earth, but they can't admit it, even in confidence. 
We know the earth isn't flat, they say, but it really is. We know you use the same map as we do, but ours is just an image. And anyone who says differently is obviously crazy. It makes you wonder how long the USGS has been using that model as an official reference. The United Nations started using it for their logos in 1945, and then made some final adjustments in 1947. And the UN flag also raises a few questions, like, why isn't Antarctica represented on the map? Is it supposed to be assumed in the outer circle, or perhaps the spiky olive branches on the outside? They don't mention it anywhere online. And this is what I'd like to focus on. The gaps, the holes in the plot, the unanswered questions. The USGS using the same map as the Flat Earth, but not saying why, not recognizing it, or that you can't link the very same image from the Flat Earth Wiki back to the actual AE definition of the projection. The authority figured out in the 1950s all of the borders of our enclosed world, and have done a great job hiding it over the decades. But the world's a complex place, and there are clues out there just lying around. I think it's time you saw some of them. So do some of your own research, and ask questions. Please feel free to email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net, or 303-494-6631. Flat Earth Clues, Part 4. Shell Beach. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the Flat Earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue covers the near-perfect design of the Flat Earth model and will break down some of the logic behind the decisions made. It sounds like a big task, and it is, but to start, let's look at something small, like this little guy. Take an ordinary mouse and put it into a glass cage. It doesn't have to be a mouse. It could be a snake, a lizard, an insect. It makes little difference for this exercise. People identify with mice because they're used to seeing them in lab experiments. Mice also don't have any sinister connotations. They're seen as relatively innocent and benign, the perfect test subject, as it were. I have yet to meet anyone who has a bias against the lab mouse. So the mouse goes into the box for the first time, and the reaction is always the same. It explores its surroundings, and more importantly, tests the barrier around it, probing for exits, or potential exits. The mouse inspects every inch of its new glass home, and at some point, settles into the acceptance that the walls are indeed solid, and that it may be there for a while. Every so often, it will repeat the process, again checking the boundaries of the cage, just in case something has changed. What it doesn't do is act like it would in the wild, because it realizes that it's in a form of captivity. The glass box doesn't even remotely resemble its natural environment. You could put this box in the middle of a forest, and the mouse may feel slightly better about its situation, but it still knows that it's been trapped against its will, and will settle into a non-native lifestyle. You could take all the other small animals that could be substituted for a mouse, the snake, the lizard, the insect, it makes no difference. The result will invariably be the same. Repeated probing for escape routes, then acceptance. Take the same animal and now put it into the middle of a hundred mile square wildlife preserve, surrounded on all sides by a similar type of glass enclosure. The creature doesn't even bother to rush the size of the preserve and start testing the boundaries, mostly because it's out of visual range. It could be days or even weeks before it even encounters a single fence. The animal's routine is spent doing what it normally would do. It eats, it sleeps, it breeds. It does everything that it would naturally do in the wild. If one day the animal approaches the fence, there might be some curiosity, but any anxiety is quickly resolved by just turning around and heading back into the vast expanse from which it came. The fence does not pose a potential problem for the animals in the preserve because it is so small compared to the expanse they live in, and dwelling on it doesn't hold any interest. We're assuming here that the fence is high enough to discourage flying creatures as well, deep enough to stop burrowing classes, and if you want, reaches the floor of any nearby bodies of water, stopping any clever aquatic types. 
The point here is that all creatures great and small inside a giant wildlife preserve, when countering the fence, wouldn't care. They would all, in their own way, just shrug and move on with their lives. However, if you take a human, male or female, regardless of education or nurturing, and put them in the exact same wildlife sanctuary, the response would be quite different. When the human approaches the glass fence, they don't see it as a minor distraction. They pause, they wonder, and more importantly, they ask questions, either internally or amongst others. Why is the fence here? How far does it reach? Can I dig underneath, or climb over, or go around it? These questions continue in a way you might imagine, but eventually a bigger question jumps to the top of the list. Who built the fence? It is that which changes not only the type of questions being asked, but how the human being, or beings, look at their world. The giant wildlife preserve suddenly gets smaller. Each new fence border discovered starts to artificially constrict their expanse, even though the dimensions haven't changed. Before long, the preserve, their home, loses some of its relevance. The fence is a reminder of the unknown. It provokes fear and endless speculation within the human. Given enough time, the importance of the preserve continues to be reduced, especially in relation to the fence. And the reason why it's so engrossing for the human is simple. It's there. It's real. They can see it, and maybe even touch it. Adding more humans to the equation increases the disparity of the situation by orders of magnitude. Have you seen the fence? Do you know how long it's been here? Have you ever known anyone that's been outside it? It's older than us. Who is responsible for the fence? What can we do to appease the group that created it? You can see what this might lead to. A long-lasting group hysteria would entrench itself within the population, grab hold and never let go. The fence is bigger, older, and wiser than they are. It humbles them. It angers them. And it is forever. It is their proof of a higher power. Maybe not God, but certainly God-like. No civilization, regardless of technology, discipline, or age, would be able to cope with the existence of it. For the human psyche, there are just too many questions that go unanswered. Life would never be able to progress normally. To summarize, a garden variety wildlife preserve would work for 99.99% .99 of all the world's life forms. For human beings, however, you would need to make some modifications, or really just one big one. So let's take a look at a few examples of how this could be accomplished, and from there expand it. The first failed example can be seen in the 1998 movie Dark City. This is a good starting point to get you in the right mindset. The premise here is that an advanced race creates a small flat earth area, complete with a traditional dome. The design, however, is initially flawed in that they built the city all the way to the outer edge, leaving no room for error. To compensate for this, they altered the memories of the human population on a regular basis, therefore repressing any long-term investigations. However, in movies, there are always anomalies, like the police officer who realizes that even though he remembers visiting a place called Shell Beach, there is no way to reach it because Shell Beach is outside of the flat world and never existed. He just keeps going around the circular city that has no exits. In the end, another man, the hero of the movie, makes it to the edge, steals the advanced race's power, and creates an ocean, which really should have been there in the first place. Move from there to a movie released only four months later called The Truman Show. Inevitably, all Flat Earthers have to take a hard look at this movie from a technical point of view. The movie follows the same lines as Dark City, but in a much more relatable premise, that of a giant television stage built so that the outside world can watch a person go through his life without any knowledge that he is living inside a flat world, surrounded by a physical dome. The movie is interesting on several levels, including construction. Using their existing model of a small town bordered on one side by a large lagoon and wilderness and the other a seemingly expansive ocean, while better than Dark City, still had its flaws. For one, it was less than 20 miles across 
and even though Truman's desire to explore was repressed, there was still a chance that he would venture to the outer edge, which is where the movie ended. But for the most part, it worked. Truman believed the entire scenario because he was born into it, and then lived 30 plus years without any reason to doubt where he was, which could be said for any of us. If it wasn't for the, and we'll say movie mistakes, that the studio fell victim to, then the show would have never ended. And this then raises hypothetical scenarios like, how many kids like Truman could you have raised inside that dome? 10? 50? Now, logistically, you can see how it might be problematic in keeping tabs on that many kids, especially as they got older. But with enough sleight of hand, it could be possible. A fictional situation just like that was made into the 2004 movie, The Village. And even though it turned into one of those M. Night Shyamalan plot twist things, the premise was very feasible. A wealthy group of idealists buy a large parcel of land in an existing wildlife preserve, create a small town from the 1800s, and raise children there. They pay off government officials to keep planes far away and spread a myth that monsters live in the forest. As far as the kids are concerned, they actually are living in a small Pennsylvania town in the 1800s. And being born into it, why wouldn't they? If the story continued, eventually the elders that founded the town would all pass away, leaving the children to pass on the legacy, free from any burden of guilt that their world was not what it appeared to be. And keep in mind, this was done with very little land manipulation and no dome. This then circles back to how many actors the fictional Truman Show really needed to hire. Other than the leads who did product placement, the rest of the town could actually just live their lives like anyone else. Use phone lines to call outside, go to restaurants, watch television at home, and so on. But again, I digress. Assuming the technology was possible, how many people like Truman could you keep in a dome the size of, say, a state that was hundreds of miles across? probably thousands. If you kept expanding the size of the dome to a few thousand miles, well then you're talking millions. But when it gets that big, something interesting happens. You don't need the actors anymore. Start it up like the village, and within just a few generations, everyone is oblivious. And you can leave them to their own devices. Starting to sound familiar? In fact, the larger you make the enclosed world, the less micromanaging needs to be done. It gets easier as it scales up. This brings us back to the missing modification you need for the human race. To keep the storylines consistent and remove all the hocus-pocus of monsters in the woods or that you can't get to Shell Beach, you place in gradual negative reinforcement, one that creates an illusion of choice. Say, for example, that Truman went out in the sailboat the same as before, but this time the dome was twice the size and the simulated ocean far larger. How far would he travel before getting hungry, thirsty, or tired? The movie ending is then in doubt. And if you compare this scenario, where where you are now, then you start to see it. Look at the flat earth map again. Continents grouped in the center, surrounded in all directions by hundreds of miles of salt water. Think about how much further ancient ships would have traveled if you could drink what you were sailing on. As you move closer to the edge, the temperature starts taking a nosedive. Then you start seeing icebergs. If that doesn't stop you, then you run into what we call Antarctica, which is a steep climb two miles up with no plant life or indigenous livestock animals. And if you had the wherewithal to make it that far, you would still have hundreds of miles of endless ice and snow. It's easy to see why so few people have gone the distance. Compare this to the upper ceiling, which is much easier to maintain. You simply decrease the oxygen rates so that every thousand feet up it gets more difficult to breathe. This slows down exploration over mountain ranges and discourages limited control flight such as balloons. Also keep in mind that the dome itself doesn't have to be that high in relation to the outer ring. 
With commercial aircraft capping out at 10 miles and rockets less than 400, the dome would actually look more like a stadium roof, depending on how you wanted to display things like the sun, moon, and stars. An enclosed world with these type of safeguards would be able to sustain an unknowing population for, say, what, 4,500 years? Then you could artificially introduce a globe model into the scientific community before the civilization technology reaches a point that could lead to discovery. And 500 years later, here we are. A civilization inside an amazing structure, doing what we would naturally do, while the authority stands by the gate and fears the consequences if we ever found out for ourselves. So do some of your own research and ask questions. Please feel free to email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or 303-494-6631. Flat Earth Clues, Part 5, The Status Quo. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat Earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue covers the inevitable and sometimes frustrating question of why the authority would go to all the trouble of hiding the flat Earth. My hope here is to show you different angles, and a progression of events, all of which lead to a very changed world, both physically and mentally. To open, we have to go way back to when the world was a much more simple place. You had your five major religions, including Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Each of these groups had their own version of what is known in Genesis as the firmament or the flat circular world enclosed by a solid dome-like barrier from where the creator or creators looked on. I'm not going to explore all the subtle differences between the groups. Suffice it to say that it's interesting that despite their differences that led to acts of horrible violence between them, there was no real earth model debate. So around 500 years ago, the science community, led by Copernicus, who probably had a little help, introduced what we now know as the heliocentric, or globe model, of the world, which in turn changed the solar system, galaxy, and so on. The religions, seeing that this globe model was gaining popularity, feared a loss in the fan base, so they all adapted their religion to include the globe model. From their point of view, it was a small change from a circular to a globe world, and really, in a few generations, who would remember anyway? So the churches, mosques, temples wrapped up their flat earth model in a metaphoric soft cloth and put it in the drawer with the good silver for safekeeping. Remember this, because we'll come back to it later. And hundreds of years went by, with science promoting all the aspects of the globe and the religions promoting their beliefs upon this globe. The world kept spinning, so to speak, and everyone was happy. Then in the early part of the 1900s, you get this pesky explorer named Richard Byrd. He has family money, all the right connections, and secures basically unlimited funding and the government green light to probe every piece of unseen territory there is. It was inevitable, I guess. A young man who has an unquenchable desire to see all that there is to see, and then granting him the tools needed to accomplish this goal. He pulls a Truman and gets lucky, crossing the vast salt ocean, avoiding the icebergs, arriving at the frozen coastline, and he keeps going. He was never going to stop. One day, after crossing hundreds of miles of high-altitude ice and snow, Admiral Byrd sees it. A barrier. And to him, it's just a barrier, not THE barrier. He is but a tiny speck in front of it. It stretches out on both sides as far as he can see, and straight up so far that he can't discover the beginning of the arc. The great explorer now has a new challenge, finding the shape of this thing. It's much like a blind man describing it the elephant. Until you feel out the whole thing, what do you really know? If you look at the AE, or Flat Earth Overhead Map, you see the problem. To even determine the scope of the outer wall, you have to circle it. It would have taken months, if not years, 
You could use a series of ships going in opposite directions, or planes, but there are refueling stations that need to be built, and so on. His task was challenging to say the least. Admiral Byrd kept laying the groundwork of the great discovery until his eventual death in 1957. A year later, the United States and Russia found the upper edge. From there, the math was easy. And moreover, you could actually see the real world. Then, of course, there is the decision, or deception, depending on how you looked at it. The authority made the call to hide the actual shape of where we live, then sealed off the outer edge from prying eyes, and created the space program not only to reinforce the globe model, but to control it. There was really only one reason they cared about this, and it takes a while to process. So let's look at the immediate effects of actual disclosure and work our way up to the authority's biggest fear. For this exercise, we'll look at releasing the news today instead of, say, 1958. While 1958 would have been easier, it's much more relevant and entertaining to explain it in modern terms. We start with a press conference by, let's say, the United Nations, who have discovered that the world is indeed enclosed in a giant high-tech dome of unknown origin and age. The public reacts with wonder and awe, trying to take in the sheer scope of this announcement. Facebook crashes, Twitter crashes, entire mobile networks crash. It's like hitting a beehive with a sledgehammer. News organizations around the world send teams to the outer edge to confirm the finding, and the general public is glued to their media devices. That's the good news, the excitement, the revelation, the positive shock. Then the bad news starts coming in waves, some of which you might not expect. The first is the immediate disbanding of NASA and all other world space programs, for obvious reasons. Most governments will secretly pardon these groups and keep them immune from class action lawsuits, the lawsuits themselves coming from NASA investment groups claiming fraud. Regardless, everyone at NASA, despite their good intentions, is out of a job overnight. And this is where you would say, good, they deserve it. About time they stopped lying to everyone. Oh, but it doesn't stop there, because every contractor and subcontractor that are exclusively tied to NASA, they have to shut down as well. Fine, a few thousand jobs lost, no big deal. And the ripples continue to spread, some bigger than others. Observatories all over the world close their doors. And the reasoning is this. If you've been looking at the ceiling for decades and couldn't tell it was a ceiling, then what good are you? Every university in the world that has an astronomy or astrophysics program, well, they don't anymore. Stephen Hawking? His book writing days are over. Carl Sagan? No more Nova in syndication, I guarantee it those professors are going to have to retool their skills and be prepared to answer one giant question. How did you not see it? Weren't there clues? People start finger pointing and it will continue for years. And still my fellow flat earthers will say, well hell, that doesn't sound too bad. So some nerds around the world lose their jobs. So what? Eh, you don't get off that easy, is what? The finger pointing at the now defunct NASA will then turn to finger pointing at the government who directed the whole thing. This is where we run into some dangerous ground involving things like the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and the Ring of Power. And you say, you lost me. I was with you until you started bringing up religious artifacts from movies. And you're supposed to be lost. Of the five major religions we mentioned earlier, those being Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, none have been able to produce a supernatural object over the last 5,000 years. And trust me, it would be beneficial to do so. The Ark of the Covenant would benefit Judaism, the Holy Grail Christianity, and the Ring of Power, well, that benefits someone else. Maybe I'll leave alone for now. The point is that all religions are actively seeking their leverage against science. You've heard of the division between church and state. Well, here it is. Advantage church. The barrier becomes a giant religious symbol, 
and since it is backed by the Big Five, it also becomes universal. The Big Five then go into their drawer with the good silver and pull out this belief that was forgotten but not lost and say, we knew it all along and science lied to us. Temporarily, all religions unite against science, who has been only moderately weakened by the removal of their astronomy and astrophysics divisions. But the public won't care, because they will listen to the group shouting the loudest, and no one yells louder than the church. They will scream with righteous fury that the dome was built by our God, your God, and the people will turn to science and hear nothing but crickets. And that's where the world changes, because in times of great stress, the public will want words, and while religion has no shortage of them, science simply is incapable of taking leaps of faith. I'll take a glass half full approach and say that anyone listening to this is probably an intelligent, rational person, one who can make informed decisions outside of the conventional doctrine. But for every one of you, there are hundreds if not thousands, of mouth-breathing troglodytes who will not walk but run to the respective house of religion and say, you were right about this. What else can you teach me? This is what fills the current authority with pause, the unknown response to that question. Will religion take the high road and work with what remains of science to discover the truth? It's possible, I suppose. It's also possible that religion will combine this technologically advanced society with a revitalized and aggressive doctrine that then transforms daily life into something that makes the book 1984 seem like a Saturday morning cartoon show. I'm hoping that mankind will prove me wrong, but so far, that isn't the case. So do some of your own research and ask questions. Please feel free to email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or 303-494-6631. Flat Earth Clues Part 6 Depth Perception This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the Flat Earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue looks into the inevitable design question below the surface, or more specifically, how thick the flat earth design would need to be. To start, let's quickly recap the design features so far. A basic dome structure made up of advanced high density material thousands of miles wide and at least a hundred miles in height. The ceiling of said structure being projected upon by an ultra high definition system using super LED technology and a combination of 2D and 3D imaging to simulate all celestial bodies including Sun, Moon, stars, and so on. This ceiling is then protected by a scaling decrease in temperature and oxygen levels to the point where human life isn't naturally sustainable above four miles. The lower surface of the dome structure consists of an organic layout of continents grouped at the center, ensuring that no land bridge exists to the outer ring. This is then surrounded by hundreds of miles of salt water in order to limit sea travel. The salt oceans are then adjusted with a scaling decrease in temperature as the outer area is approached to the point where salt water freezes, forming icebergs, further reducing sea travel. The outer ring is then elevated to a height of 10,000 feet, reducing oxygen levels and a buffer zone of 300 miles is created. This zone is devoid of all life forms that could be used as food, further discouraging land travel. That all sounds pretty good, but we left out one thing, depth. Keeping human beings away from the ceiling is easy, because it requires higher technology. Protecting the outer ring is a little more difficult, but can be accomplished with layers of negative reinforcement. Protecting the actual common ground is a different challenge because digging is basic. Everyone knows how to use a shovel, and most construction requires a generous amount of digging. In addition, natural resources such as coal, oil, minerals, are harvested through large-scale digging operations. So it's safe to say that any human population is going to be digging a lot of holes, because it's easy, and it's necessary to continue their way of life. 
That being said, how thick would you need to make the Flat Earth model so that people didn't accidentally dig their way through? You could use the same method as the outside barrier and create a series of undesirable layers ending in a solid barrier, but the ever-expanding increases in general population would create an unnecessary risk. If the bottom of the flat earth was composed of, say, an unbreakable material, this would pique the digger's curiosity, and if repeated all over the world, would raise suspicions of design. While a solid barrier works at the end of a frozen wasteland where no one is venturing, or allowed, it doesn't do much if it's found in a mining quarry, or someone's backyard. For that, you need something that hasn't been used up to this point. A scaling increase in temperature, all the way to an ignition flashpoint, and then beyond. Now you will jump in and say, well of course. We all know that there is molten rock below the surface. We see it in volcanoes and, well, volcanoes. Yes, yes you do. And we've all seen the cross-section diagram of the globe Earth, which shows ever brighter bands of molten structure and so on, which is why I included the wiki link in the description that covers the official view of the Earth structure. And I quote, Scientific understanding of the internal structure of the Earth is based on observations of rock in outcrop, samples brought to the surface from greater depths by volcanoes, analysis of seismic waves, measurements of gravitational and magnetic fields, and experiments with crystals at pressure and temperatures characteristic of the Earth's deep interior. In short, they have no clue on what's below them. None. In fact, the deepest holes ever drilled which I've also linked in the description, only go down 8 miles. To repeat, no one has gone below 8 miles anywhere. And every drilling survey is the same, a scaling increase in temperature to the point where drill bits stop working. And you come back and say, but volcanoes! Yes, there are volcanoes, holes in the earth where molten rock is produced, under pressure I might add. Certainly that can't be artificially created. No? We can melt rock right now. It's called a smelting plant. What do you think your car is made out of? Melted, reformed, and polished rock. We have the technology to do this. It all comes down to scale. Create a large set of furnaces at, say, 50 miles below the surface that can melt and pump molten rock. And you say, what would the furnaces be made out of? Oh, I don't know. How about the same dome material that can withstand nuclear weapons? So you take the molten rock, locate a few random access points on the surface, and the rest comes naturally. Volcanoes also reinforce the earth structure model that the molten rock goes all the way to the core, which then in turn reinforces the globe model, and then we're back to where we are now. A smoldering globe flying through space at high speeds that, from a design standpoint, makes no sense. So how thick would the flat earth model floor need to be? Oh, for common use, say, less than 100 miles, similar to the ceiling in scale. Large heat generators placed in a pattern, a thin layer of molten rock 10 to 20 miles down, which is really just a geologic pipe system to help with the generation of terrain. And there you have it an efficient way of discouraging all those digging humans from reaching too far, combining a physical barrier with a mental one. Eight miles down and you're going to tell me what the entire core looks like? Give me a break. So do some of your own research and ask questions. Please feel free to email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or 303-494-6631. Flat Earth Clues Part 7 the long haul. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue looks into a topic I only glanced at in the original guide, which is the southern hemisphere, or in the flat earth model, the land masses closest to the outer ring. I like to give credit where credit is due, and the long haul title was given to me by a fellow flat earther who did some of the same research I did. The summary of the video is this. If you are looking to show someone how to view the flat earth from a practical point of view, this is the example I would use. 
I'm going to show you how strange the world looks using just a few websites, some simple math, a couple minutes, and your brain. You don't have to write anything down, unless you want to, of course. I'll give you everything you need on screen and break down one of the examples as well. I'll also link the sites in the description for reference. First, here are some websites that help you calculate distance. The GPS on your phone already does this, and you may have an app as well, but here are some dedicated examples. Uh, Timeanddate.com, tripit.com, distancefrom2.net, worldatlas.com, freemaptools.com, and travelmath.com. If your favorite isn't listed here, like Google Maps, then use whatever is most familiar to you. Now we are going to look at two specific groups of cities. The first group is going to be from the area around Australia, including New Zealand. We'll call this Group 1. Group 1 includes Melbourne, Australia, Sydney, Australia, Perth, Australia, Auckland, New Zealand, Christchurch, New Zealand, and Hamilton, New Zealand. The second group is going to be some cities in South America, all in the Southern Hemisphere. I mention this because if you go high enough, you will run into a few cities that won't work. Group 2 includes Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Brasilia, Brazil, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Lima, Peru, and Santiago, Chile. Again, there is a link in the description with many other airports. Now, these two groups are interchangeable, as you would imagine, so you can start or end with either Group 1 or 2. The results will be the same, and just to make it interesting, I'll use a slightly different example which a fellow flat earther did the legwork on and show you that even these two groups aren't exclusive. So you take anything from group 1 and anything from group 2 and you get some distances ranging from 6 to 8,000 miles roughly. That's all I want you to do here is get that part in your head noticing that the root is bent because they have to account for the curvature of the earth. All these directions are what you would expect, a straight shot over the South Pacific Ocean. Now just to prove it's not an exclusive route, instead of starting in, say, Rio and landing in Auckland, I'll start what should be the opposite side, in Cape Town, South Africa, which is roughly the same distance on a globe Earth coming in at 7,300 miles. Notice on the map it's still a straight shot through the Indian Ocean and not crossing any countries an easy route. I try to book my flight. For this example we use travel math, but you can use whatever is easiest in your country, like Priceline, Expedia, Travelocity. It will make no difference because they're all tied to the same system. And this is when everything goes wrong. So the first leg, the airlines don't send me due east, but instead shoot me 4,700 miles almost due north to Dubai okay, maybe we're just picking up people. Seems a bit excessive, but I'll go with it. I'm probably comfortable in my seat drinking vodka tonics anyway. And from Dubai, it should be a straight shot home to Auckland, right? Er, no. Now they send me southeast to Melbourne, a mere 7,300 miles. And then finally a third leg from Melbourne to Auckland coming in at around 1,600 miles. I'm rounding up or down to make the math easier. Regardless, the total miles for this flight is almost double what should be expected, coming in at 13,600 miles. In addition, the trip took me 37 hours. How long should it have taken? Well, in a triple seven, about 12. Now this is where you come in and say, well, it's probably an isolated incident, or some strange connection thing. You know how the airlines are. Oh no, my friends. We can do this all day. This roulette table is rigged, and there is no way to get a fair game. The first part of the clue is the utter lack of non-stop flights from anywhere in this hemisphere, which is why I gave you multiple cities in each group. And here's the plot hole for you. Flying from international cities like Sydney, Rio, Santiago, or anywhere else close by, you can't get a single non-stop flight, no matter how much money you pay. I tried to do this for an entire night, and it was like playing an online casino game, one that I was losing most of the time. 
the connections kept coming in like spam windows. Start in Christchurch, go to Auckland. Start in Auckland, go to Sydney. Start in Sydney, go to Dubai or Los Angeles or somewhere else that makes no sense. Some of these connections took the trip over 50 hours to complete. Go ahead, try it yourself. You may find one non-stop. But even then, the strangeness doesn't end there, because the speed is wrong. For reference, I included an optimum cruising speed guide from a commercial pilot's forum that lists all the international aircraft used in these routes. A 777, the current state-of-the-art flagship plane, designed for maximum fuel efficiency, has a cruising speed of 640 miles an hour. 7,400 miles comes in at around 12 hours. Try to find this route. It doesn't exist. It can't. The closest I came was a one-connection flight with a three-hour layover. The total flight time was 20 hours. 20, take away 3, is 17, not 12. And this might work if the plane was doing, say, 430 miles an hour. But it's not. In fact, the slowest cruising speed I found was an older Airbus just around 593. But this is all just numbers, right? It is until you pull up the flat earth map and look at the farthest two points, which just coincidentally are anywhere in Australia and most of South America. Or my example of Lower Africa, which you can see isn't west at all. It's a shell game, and a very good one at that. Keep people guessing with multiple connections and layovers, jumping from city to city. People just sit in their seats, trying to sleep through it. And then it hits you. Well, the pilots would know, right? They fly all day every day. Certainly, they would have figured it out by now. Some of them would get suspicious, sure. Any decent navigator will be able to work out the speed, fuel consumption, and odd connections. But imagine what they would have to get their head around. First, they would have to ignore the world GPS system that has been leading them to their destinations without error. If you want some interesting side reading, check out the link on the history of the GPS. And I quote, Developed in 1973 to overcome the limitations of previous navigation systems, integrating ideas from several predecessors, including a number of classified engineering design studies from the 1960s, oh, and by the way, was created by the Department of Defense, the same people that closed off Antarctica. GPS went fully live in 1995, so if you were a pilot before then, you might have been able to pick up a breadcrumb trail. After that, very difficult. Plus, let's say you did figure out that something was off. Who exactly would you tell? The FAA? You would be looking around and wondering why you were the only one to see it. And then what? You make the leap of faith and see that the entire map system is wrong? Never gonna happen. You might as well just tell them that an alien spacecraft followed your plane around for two hours. We know what happens then. Start playing Flight Time Casino for yourself. See what interesting things you can discover. And while you're at it, show it to any pilots that you know. But don't forget to leave the words Flat Earth out. Because that's crazy, right? So do some of your own research and ask questions. Please feel free to email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or 303-494-6631. Flat Earth Clues, Part 8. The Creative Force. This Flat Earth perspective takes a look at the design from the ever-present why standpoint, and although it will review some of the dome technical features already discussed, I'll try to do it from a different angle, or more specifically, why I might build it. Someone mentioned to me recently that while the dome was a very big concept, it made the world much smaller. Kind of like what Admiral Byrd expressed in an interview all those years ago. This someone also said that it made them sad, which I understood. And while I did what I could to comfort this person, I realized that I could have done more. So this video is for the people who look upon this world with their new eyes and start drifting into a state of melancholy. To preface, this isn't jail nor are you lab rats. And before I'm done, I hope to show you a version of why. To start, let's look at an old story, one that you may have heard involving another enclosed world. 
kind of like yours. I say kind of like yours because the finished design that you are sitting in right now took several revisions in just about every aspect, much like any project. You come up with ideas, you see what works and what doesn't, and you improve the process until you come up with something that, while not everyone agrees upon, satisfies the best of all criteria. One of the first dome layouts involved a race of people who were supremely driven by ambition. They didn't have a word for lazy or fear. They absorbed knowledge very quickly, incorporating physics, advanced electronics, engineering, and drove their technology with energy from the enclosed world itself. And when their technology had reached the point where the dome structure was discovered in its entirety, there was no reaction of wonder and awe. They just looked up and squinted at the sky. Eventually, those squints turned into glares. Oh, they had religion, to be sure, and it was tied to their daily lives, but to them, this wasn't religion. It was a challenge. Almost like they weren't that impressed. Hard to fathom, right? Seeing that your world had borders, but instead of being afraid, shaking your fist at the sky with arrogance. But that's what they did. So much confidence and might that when they found out where they really were, a new priority was created. At first they dedicated broadcast channels to calling the dome builders out, demanding answers, and ran them day and night. At the end of each cycle, the words kept repeating, We know. But arrogance ebbs at patience, and their demands were met with silence, which was taken as blatant dismissal. This fueled their ambition even more. The people withdrew all their efforts from breaching the outer barrier and formed a new plan. If the creators were not going to submit, then they would build a bridge and meet them at the gates. So a building was designed, but to call it a building was to call the pyramids a sand castle. It was the greatest structure ever conceived, at least to them. It was to be over 30 miles wide and hundreds of miles high, enough to reach the dome ceiling itself, where they would meet the builders face to face. They abandoned nature completely and pushed aside ecologic systems to accomplish their goal. They cannibalized entire mountain ranges, which they used to admire and love, to acquire the raw material for the awesome structure. The work crews built with flawless precision, and it was obvious that it was going to succeed. A bridge to the edge of the sky itself. The work would only pause long enough for the mighty armies below to look up and yell, We come for you! So loudly that on a clear day you could actually feel the dome shake. And the creators, faced with their first great challenge, decided to start again. And the people were changed, their language fragmented so that the builders couldn't continue. The tower was dismantled, their technology removed and forgotten, and the people scattered. A new group was introduced to the dome, divided in every way imaginable, so that unity was next to impossible, and everything slowed down. Languages evolved and devolved into other dialects, and the languages produced text which produced different forms of culture, and some amazing things began to happen, the most important of which was the arts. The dome builders saw the artistic pool develop into several distinct forms, everything drawn in any medium on a flat surface. Everything molded that took on a three-dimensional shape. Everything that produced music. All things that make up the human form and motion. And all the written works. Pictures, sculptures, music, dance, literature, the arts. Driven by passion, it is the very essence of what is good in humanity. Once this was recognized, all dome methods put in place were to cultivate and enhance this process. Land masses were adjusted with geology and temperature to support every kind of terrain with 
mountains, rivers, oceans, plains, forests, jungles, deserts, all of it stunning, all of it stimulating the human mind, nourishing it. And the modifications continued, with seemingly endless shades of weather. The sky was overhauled, a moon added, and layers upon layers upon layers of stars, so that one day, when the people were able to see further than their own eyes, there would still be something new to see. And the arts flourished, but there was a cost. The languages and division of cultures had put the population at odds, and wars were raging at regular intervals. The dome builders debated if the price was too high. Plans were drawn up to make more changes, until they noticed that the arts thrived even through the worst of conflicts, producing grace and beauty despite their burning world. It was wonderful and terrible at the same time, and the debate outside the barrier continued to intensify until a majority spoke out and said, this world is a creative force, and we must see what it leads to. The barrier must be hidden at all costs. So the globe model was put into the population, and both science and religion adapted to it. The arts grabbed onto it like a new drug, the creative minds of the world exploding with new concepts. Their universe was now infinite, and the rules changed. Science then led to science fiction, which opened up everything else. Books, pictures, sculptures, dance, and music, all reaching deep into space, decade after decade of wonderful possibilities rising above the ashes that were at their feet. And it's not just the artists. It's everyone. You affect others who affect others, who inspire others, who build it, paint it, sculpt it, sing it, who then put it up on a pedestal and hold it under the light and say, this is a piece of who we are. And for every one of them, there are hundreds of others who, for whatever reason, were unable to express the songs and images and stories that are in their heads. Imagination is far more important than knowledge, because it is limitless. It is your shield, your sword against the cruelty of destructive forces. There are those right now who live in chaos, whose life is surrounded by a swirling nightmare from which they think they'll never escape. These are the true warriors of the world, and they are far braver than me. I am humbled by those who suffer the most. Know that mountains were built for you, oceans were built for you, all of this was built for you, your struggles and your trials by fire. It may be today, it may be tomorrow, but one day the curtain will close and this stage will be struck. And when the dust settles, no matter where you are right now, you'll see the big picture and have new eyes and you will be shown what wonder really is. And as you leave this most magnificent of theaters, heading towards the next, my hope is that you'll pause, look back at the stage and say, I was actually in it, you know, right there in the thick of things. And it was a sight to see. Because it really is a hell of a ride. Imagine what the next one will be like. Earth Clues Part 9, The Magic Show. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This flat earth perspective initially started out as a problem solving exercise that was going to be built into Clue 7, otherwise known as the Long Haul. But after some research and a little patience, it has evolved into something that warranted its own section and is a perfect example of good things come to those who wait. So emails and phone calls have been coming in, almost all of them positive, 
several people from around the world commented on the southern plain routes. They said that, well, 95% of the long routes in that hemisphere were connections, which in itself raises red flags. There were a few pesky non-stops that seemed to contradict the overall logic. The question then posed to me was, obviously, are they real flights? Could they be put there to throw the Flat Earth group off? If it was a trick, could I figure out what it was and how it was accomplished? I accepted the challenge and started my impression of Morgan Freeman as he went up against the Four Horsemen magician crew. Now, admittedly, I was skeptical to start because the flights went against the third rule, that being the Flat Earth has no shortcuts. Only a globe has shortcuts. As in magic, I had to assume the rule was not being broken, but only hidden, or having the illusion of being broken. But first, I had to see the trick itself. I had to see the planes in question, and see them make the route. Anyone can list a flight, but does it actually go from point A to point B? With the help of several other people, this was then put to the test. While just about everyone with a cell phone knows about GPS and how it can track things, many people don't know that even though it's a system built by the military, there is a very public aspect to it. So while your phone is tracked at all times, so are other things, most notably all air traffic. Now, if you're military, you could view military planes. If you work at a cargo carrier like UPS or FedEx, you can view transport planes. The general public is mostly limited to commercial air traffic. This can be viewed in several places, and the one I chose was planefinder.net. You can use others like FlightAware, FlightRadar24, FlightTracker. It makes no difference because they are all tied into the same exact GPS system. All these sites do basically the same thing. Track every commercial plane in the world from start to end in real time. So I spend day after day looking at the Plane Finder global map, which you see here. At any given time, it's tracking between three to 7,000 flights that are en route anywhere in the world. You'll notice two different colors for planes, red and yellow. Yellow just means there's a five minute delay in processing and only applies to the United States. The point here is in order to prove out these flights that go against flat earth theory, I need to watch a few as they cross either the South Pacific or Indian Oceans. The web page updates automatically, but just to be sure, I close and reopen the page every 30 minutes or so and wait for an ocean plane. And I wait. And I wait. And I wait some more. Hours pass. Days pass. And no red planes to entertain me. And somewhere in this process of me just staring at these empty oceans, waiting for a plane to cross, something occurs to me. Can you guess what it is? Nothing is crossing these oceans. Not non-stops, connections, multiple connections, nothing. But that's not possible, right? The planes have to reach their destinations. So I change gears and just watch the coastlines of anything in the southern hemisphere. And I start to see it. I follow a simple plane out of Brazil on its way to South Africa, which, by the way, is not part of the long-haul argument. It's offshore just a few hundred miles. I get something to drink, and when I come back, it's gone. Hmm. Just a glitch, right? So I follow another, and another, and the same thing happens again and again. Once the plane reaches an imaginary line in the water, GPS makes it disappear. Then a friend who is also working on this problem sends me some links, which I've included in the description. I encourage you to take a look at them. At first, they don't seem like much, just an average flight log showing speed, altitude, locations, 
things you could expect. Then you scroll down to about 3.30 in the morning and the location drops away and is replaced by either the word approximate or the word estimated. This then continues for the next five hours until, miraculously, one hour before landing, the flight log reestablishes itself and the GPS system shows the plane in real time about to reach its destination. So to be clear to those who may not be seeing everything here, the flights are being dropped off GPS and their flight data is also turned off and stays off until they are almost on top of their arrival point. And you say, well, that's how GPS works. Well, no, because the Northern Hemisphere has planes flying all over their oceans. And then you say that maybe it's a localized Southern Hemisphere thing. And I say, then why are all the flights over or near land perfectly tracked? Furthermore, this is a U.S.-based system with Americans flying on vacation every single day. You're telling me that those people aren't going to be tracked? In addition, the Vanishing Plane Act is happening to not only the South Pacific and Indian Oceans, which I would expect, but also the South Atlantic, which isn't part of the Flat Earth argument. There are a bunch of flights that cross this relatively small ocean between South America and Africa, and every one of the planes is hidden shortly after takeoff. So then you say, what would be the purpose of hiding those shorter routes in the Atlantic? It's because of something I didn't see right away. If you hide one flight, you have to hide them all. Showing the GPS routes in the Atlantic, but leaving out the Pacific and Indian Oceans would raise different questions. So the logic here, despite being very sneaky, is sound. The third rule is that the Flat Earth has no shortcuts. If you look at the azimuthal equidistant map again and look close, you notice that while the South Pacific, South Atlantic, and Indian Oceans make up the lower sections on a globe, they make up the outer ring on a flat model. In that model, there is no shortcut between Australia and South America. If you are creating flight routes, you have only two choices. You take the long way around, clockwise or counterclockwise, and stay on the ocean. Or you cut across the land in the middle. But if you cut across the land, you have to create connections. Because on a globe, it wouldn't make sense to fly over the top of the United States to get to South America. Neither of these choices are ideal. So the authority came up with a compromise. Disable GPS and lose the planes for every ocean flight in the Southern Hemisphere. Then reactivate them once the destination is reached. This is just one of the lengths that they are willing to use to keep you from seeing it. Don't just hide some things. Hide everything so that maybe the topic isn't addressed. And some would come back and say, well, nice going. You just pointed out a flaw in their system, and sooner or later, they will fix the gap. Hmm, maybe. But not soon, I think. Remember, this is a rule, not a guideline. They can't change the map, so they have to work within its limitations. If they have a better workaround, I can't wait to see it. So do your own research and ask questions. Oh, by the way, welcome to the Flat Earth and enjoy your flight. Flat Earth Clues Part 10 Hiding God This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the Flat Earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. As you can tell from the title, I'm taking a different approach. Eventually, I was going to have to address the question of what happens next, or what we do now with the information at hand. 
If you've made it through the guide and the first nine clues, then at this point you're either buying into the flat model or on the fence. If this is the first one you went to because of the title, I recommend you go back because we're not going to do much in the way of reviewing. But if you're still with me, then you would agree that, one, the world you've been taught has been kept from you, and two, one way or another, you would like to prove this out. So how is this possible? The authority in question who created what you call the globe is guarding all the gates. They protect the sky, the outer edge, and most importantly, the education system that shows us at an early age what they want us to see. Nobody listening to this has their own spaceship or advanced rocket program. Nobody actually owns a long-distance icebreaker. And while some of you may have a private plane, I wouldn't recommend testing a military barrier that technically doesn't exist. But then again, you have to remember that this is not the story of David and Goliath. The hidden world was never going to be sustainable forever. As a civilization evolves, the tools the authority uses as a method of control become more vulnerable. I've learned many things about systems over the years, and one thing that I find most interesting is as layers of strength increase, the higher the chance that they can be used to your advantage. But maybe I'm talking in riddles. I should be boiling it down to what can be done by showing you what's being hidden, what's important, and how it can be spread to others without looking like a crazy person. To be clear, and I can't stress this enough, do not start conversations with the word flat earth. Think of it like fight club. The first rule of flat club is that you do not talk about flat club. Before you started waking up and watching all these things, you were like me. You laughed and mocked everything that was flat earth. You may have learned faster than others, but the knee-jerk reaction by 99% of the people was created the day they sat down in a classroom and stared at the globe. Look at the videos. Not just mine, but others who are putting forward some great arguments, and ask the questions that people can relate to. I'm going to introduce three very important questions that you can use, each with a statement that precedes it, and each statement is a motivation for a different group of people. If you don't fall into one of these three groups, then I guarantee you know people that do. The first statement is this, you are being hidden. What do I mean by that? Well, this goes back to Clue 7 and Clue 9, which talk about the flights in the Southern Hemisphere. If you are flying a plane over the Southern Hemisphere, your flight is not being tracked. How can this be used to find out the truth? It's simple, it's quick, and it costs no money. No matter what country you live in, send a quick note to your local, state, or federal representative and ask them this question. Why are citizens of our country flying over oceans without the safety net of the GPS system? And remind them that GPS stands for global, not partial. Without GPS, anything could happen to your plane and no one knows where you are. And while you're at it, remind them that the GPS system was built by the United States Department of Defense, who never does anything small. The system that is in effect now has what appears to be huge deliberate gaps in the southern hemisphere only. Do not mention flat earth. Just voice your concern about the safety of you, your loved ones, and your fellow citizens. Will they get back to you? Possibly. Will they give you a satisfactory answer? Not a chance. Because they will only have what the military gives them. What this will do, however, is create a unique buzz in certain circles that may prove to be useful later. The more politicians or high-ranking officials you contact, the greater the noise. The motivation here, as you can tell, is general public concern. The second statement is this. 
wealth is being hidden. What do I mean by that? Goes back to Clue 2 and every other mention regarding Antarctica. In 1954, it was announced on national television that the continent was just millions of miles of rich energy resources. And by 1959, it was sealed off like Area 51. How can this be used to find out the truth? By contacting anyone you know in either the petroleum, natural gas, or mineral industry. This means ExxonMobil, British Petroleum, Royal Dutch Shell, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, BHP Billiton, Rio Tinto, Glencore, Anglo-American, and there are many others. Find anyone in these companies and make inquiries about their prospects in Antarctica. Send them the link to the Admiral Byrd interview and ask them why, if there are no environmental conflicts regarding oil, gas, or mining, why aren't they allowed to even petition the idea, even when the world's energy resources are dwindling more every day? Put the sound of money in their ear. They may not be able to break through the decades of red tape laid out in front of them, but it will create a buzz from a different side, the motivation of greed, and of pristine resources just begging to be harvested. And finally, to preface the third statement, I need to thank all the people who have sent me stacks and stacks of biblical scripture, asking me to stop dancing around the title of the flat model and call the structure what it really is. And you know, they have a point. I have put myself at a distance because I want to reach people who are outside of religious faith and even outside of general conspiracies. But for all those spiritual groups who have contacted me, I can now, however, say with conviction that this third statement is this. They are hiding God. Despite what labels I put on the flat model structure, the oldest names are from the oldest texts, one of those being called the firmament. If the firmament was indeed discovered in 1956 and it was deliberately hidden, then the ruling authority not only hid the structure, but evidence of the builders, and by builders I mean creators, and by that I mean what people define as God. Hiding God could be considered one of the worst ideas of all time, and if you are a person of great or small faith, you have a vested interest in any evidence that would solidify and vindicate your years of dedicated service. If a structure was found that had, for all intents and purposes, the handprint of God on it, then the ruling authority has no right to keep it from you. There are billions of people on this world who have personally dealt with the concept of God and would like to know for sure if these beliefs are well placed. Or, in short, you want to know the meaning of life. It's out there. And it's been hidden from you. Your motivation is clear. Go to your church leaders, your congregation, and tell them science probably found evidence of God in 1956 and decided to keep it a secret. If you know people of religious power, send this up the ladder. Get the word out and see what comes back. Between these three statements and questions, people will talk to people who will talk with others and eventually reach someone who knows. This isn't a grassroot or groundswell movement that takes a long time, because the system that has been used to mold and control you these past years has been based on speed, and by that I mean real time. All it takes is a single video, a memorandum, one whistleblower, one key person, and everything changes, not in months or weeks or days, but hours. And in those hours, everything changes because of the speed. People all over the world wake up and look at the sky with new eyes, and things start to get better. One person. That's all it takes. One person to come forward, 
and share what has been hidden for so long. Maybe someone who is tired of all the games. Maybe someone who has gone year after year burdened by such a heavy secret. Maybe you, who are listening right now, who is looking for a reason to come forward. This is it. And if you don't want to walk into the light and be the hero, I understand. But if you can't, for whatever reason, then be anonymous, share the message, and help us make this world better, because it can be better. For everyone else, give this person an opening, give them the opportunity, and give them the support they need to help reclaim what's left of our civilization, because we need it now more than ever. I will keep spreading the word for as long as I can, in hopes that everyone that hears it start seeing things with new eyes and I encourage each of you to do the same and maybe one day we will learn to treat others better than we treat ourselves.